Hello and welcome to Liverpool for Wildlife Trust Wildlife from the Labour Party Conference where this evening we're going to be exploring the question, what is Labour's plan to tackle the nature crisis and can it in any way help solve the crisis in our healthcare too? And we have a fantastic panel and a fantastic audience joining us here from Liverpool this evening. On the panel we will have Steve Reid, Shadow Secretary of State for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs. He's running a little bit late, as nearly always happens with fringe events at party conferences, but he will be joining us just around 10 minutes into uh, the discussion. We've also got Joe Bibby, who's Director of Health at the Health Found Foundation. Uh, we've got Fiona Harvey, who'll be known to many of you as an environmental journalist with The Guardian. And our very own Elliot Chapman-Jones, Head of Public Affairs at the Wildlife Trusts. So this was a question I was going to put to kick us off. Uh, first of all, to the Shadow Secretary of State. But as he's not here quite yet, I'm going to put it to uh, Elliot Chapman-Jones at the Wildlife Trusts. Um, what is Labour's plan to tackle the nature crisis? And can it in any way help solve the crisis in our healthcare too? Elliot, what do we know so far? Thanks very much, Craig. Well, what we know so far is that um, they're still to set out exactly what their, their plan is for restoring nature. I mean, Steve Reid's just in the job to give him a bit of credit. But let's think about what it needs to tackle. And the State of Nature report, which came out uh, the week before last, gives us a really good indication about what the pressures are facing on biodiversity and nature. And those are ultimately uh, intensive agriculture production and climate change. One in six species now in the UK is at risk of extinction. And when we did this report 10 years ago, that was one in 10 species. So in many ways, we're heading in the wrong direction. So those two big pressures biodiversity are facing. The first, of course, is on agricultural production, intensive agricultural production. So what Labour really need to look at here is farming and the way that we support farmers. The government uh, 10 years ago set out a good vision for changing the way that we support farmers in the UK uh, from the common agricultural policy which supported farmers based on the amount of land that they own, often supporting the wealthiest farmers the most, to paying them for public goods, to paying them for something that the market doesn't pay them, which might be, for example, uh, soil restoration, protecting our waterways, uh, creating new hedgerows. That's a good vision, but we've ended up with a shadow of itself and a financial settlement which is largely based on the amount of money that was delivered through the common agricultural policy. So first thing I think Labour need to look at is how much money do we need to give the farming system to properly support our farmers to restore the environment? The Wildlife Trust, RSPB and the National Trust looked at this and it's around 4.4 billion in England to actually start delivering those environmental targets. Of course, on top of that, we need to make sure that businesses start paying their way through, for example, a nature recovery obligation. So those most polluting businesses start actually restoring nature. Um, and then we need to look at climate change as well. Uh, and I think there's a recognition amongst the public particularly that climate change is now one of uh, not only the leading causes of biodiversity loss, but also is a huge solution to the climate crisis as well. So I think uh, Labour need to look at how we can start creating more space for nature and meet that tar target of 30 by 30. That's 30% 30 of land protected and restored for nature by 2030. Because currently at the moment, the government unfortunately don't have a plan to, how get, to, to get to 2030. If you look at any other kind of uh, project that the government would embark on, say that was the Olympics in 2012, for example, you would have a plan across government on exactly how we're going to meet that target. The government has yet to set that out. So I think that's another key area where Nate Labour need to start looking at. Thank you, Elliot. So, Joe Bibby, let me come to you as Director of Health at the Health Foundation. I mean, one of Labour's key uh, big five missions for government is, of course, making an NHS fit for the future, as they put it. They talk about moving to more of a neighbourhood health service, and we know that a lot of the things that influence health are people's local environmental conditions, whether it's the state of housing or the state of the local environment. I mean, what do you know of Labour's plans to tackle the nature crisis, and, and how could that potentially help uh, in any way in helping to address the crisis in healthcare too? Great, thank you. So um, it's really great actually be, to be talking to an audience that uh, is interested in environment and wildlife because um, the places we live in, the access that we have to green space, to blue space, is something that we know is good for our health and well-being. So really great to make these connections. I think um, looking in, in 
the first part of the question of Labour's plans to tackle the nature crisis, just sort of looking in as an outsider, I've got to say I'm not really very clear. Um, so it was, it was good to hear, well, they're still being developed because clearly it's not foregrounded in the five missions, but something that, you know, really does need to be um, addressed uh, just for all our benefit. So good to hear that's going to be developed. But in terms of that relationship with the healthcare system, um, I would say, I think... There's two things, really. One is that the healthcare system is under tremendous strain. And the main reason it's under that strain is because we have an ageing population. And um, we've done work forecasting what health trends are going to be in 2040. And we know that by 2040, there'll be 9 million people with major health conditions. That's 2.5 million people more than we have now. So if you just think about that, you know, we're kind of up against this... You know, it's, it's the success of medicine, really, people staying alive for longer... But it does mean that, um, you know, anything that we kind of can do for the NHS is going to um, be dwarfed by just the rising demand. So I think often it can be um, easy to think certain things are going to sort of help save the NHS, but actually we just do need to invest in the NHS because we're going to have an older and an iller population. But where I think there is the real opportunity in terms of the connection with our environment is the fact that actually, as well as seeing more older people with health conditions, which is just a natural part of the ageing process, what we're also seeing are more working age adults with illnesses. So at the moment, two and a half million people in the UK are unable to work on health grounds. That's like one and a half times the population of Greater Manchester. It's a huge number of people who are not able to support themselves and their families adequately, who kind of miss out on that sort of purpose that can come with good work and the social connections, but also can't contribute to the economy. So one of the things we're saying is this is an area we really need to focus on because it doesn't have to be like that. Um, if you compare Liverpool-Walton constituency here... 10% of the population are able to work on health grounds. If you look at somewhere like Wokingham, it's 1.5%. So it doesn't have to be like that. There's big inequalities. And the, the two main reasons why people are out of work is either mental health or musculoskeletal. They're the two biggest things that drive absence from work, both of which we know can be improved by access to nature. So getting out into nature, so much evidence about why... It's good for your mental health and your well-being and kind of creating that sort of positive outlook. Um, and in terms of being out and about that kind of physical activity, breaking the sort of cycle of sedentary lifestyles is so important around musculoskeletal. So I think these, this for me is where I would really be wanting to sort of urge that we make that connection, that we really think about giving equal access to green space, blue space, for people, particularly working age, where we know it can help them just improve their health and then also hopefully get into work where they're not doing that. So real, real potential there. Um, it's worth saying, uh, if you don't know, the, the Wildlife Trust earlier this year produced a report, um, and it's called a, a Natural Health Service. There it is. Uh, you can find that online, a Natural Health Service and we'll also be uh, tweeting that link out uh, shortly from the Wildlife Trust account, looking at the various programmes uh, run by Wildlife Trusts across the country linked to health issues. And just to, to try and understand the savings that could provide for the NHS if they were scaled up. Uh, one example really stood out for me, particularly when you were talking earlier on about ageing population. Uh, there's also the, the issues there of about a uh, uh, working population, but an ageing population... Uh, Sheffield and Rotherham Wildlife Trust have an amazing programme called Wild at Heart, which connects older people with each other and the natural environment in and around Sheffield and Rotherham. Uh, and that's leading, for the 82 participants, uh, leading to savings of around £38,000 a year uh, for the NHS in terms of uh, that sort of outpatient care and so on. Uh, and uh, this research that was done, not by us, by, by independent consultants, uh, said that if that was scaled up nationally, uh, it could probably provide reach and, and provide sort of support and treatment for up to at least, if not more, 1.2 million people. Um, and that would deliver cost saving across the NHS of around 100 million. 
That's just one programme we're talking about here, delivering better health outcomes, potential to deliver better health outcomes, but to do so more cheaply. So there's many more examples in there. So there's, there's definitely a link here. Uh, I don't think anyone's saying that this is the, the silver bullet to solving problem in healthcare. Of course not. Uh, but there's certainly a role to play. And of course, it delivers outcomes for nature as well. Um, Fiona Harvey, let me come to you. I mean, as a journalist writing across this for many years uh, and seeing how the political parties, you know, work across th this issue. Um, what's your sense as to what Labour's plan is for tackling the, the nature crisis, or what do you sense it could be, even? And, you know, what, uh, uh, what role might that play in helping solve he health care crisis, too? Thank you. Um, well, it's great that we've uh, heard so much about the nexus between uh, nature and health. It's incredibly important. Study after study shows this mental health, physical health, all improved by access to nature. Who are the people in our society who have the least access to nature? They are the poorest people in our society. Who are the people in our society who live in areas that have the worst air pollution? Again, it's the poorest people in our society. Who are the people who live in the areas where the environment is most degraded? Again, it's the poorest people in our society. So this is a question of social equity and justice as well as health. People suffer uh, uh, poor health often, uh, you know, as well as being uh, uh, suffering from environmental degradation and suffering from poverty. It's a, it's a kind of, a, it's these problems are closely intertwined together um, and we really can improve them by actually looking at that, by saying, why, why does this happen? Why is it, you know, it, it's not some actual law of physics that, uh, that people who live in, in poor areas must therefore have rubbish uh, nature uh, and no access to, to natural areas, no, no access to green space. Um, it's something that we can do an awful lot about if we actually try to tackle the problem. So my message to the Environment Secretary um, is that shadow, it is... Shadow, sorry, shadow, shadow Environment yeah, Secretary. Yeah, yeah. Shadow yeah. Environment Secretary. <laughs> Is, um, is that this is a question of social equity, social justice. Um, it's about helping the, the poorest people in our society who have an awful lot uh, that they could benefit from in terms of access to nature, uh, but at the moment uh, they're being denied that access to nature, which should be their right. Excellent. Thank you, Fiona, very much. And just before I welcome the Shadow Secretary of State, again, just to give some uh, figures on that, that we're in our Wildlife Trust report, we published over the, early the year, and Natural Health Service, um, building on the work by Professor Michael Marmot, Sir Michael Marmot, and his 2010 landmark study, Fair Society, Healthy Lives. Um, the truth is, is health inequalities have widened over the last 13 years. And uh, to put some data on what you were just saying there, Fiona, it's estimated that those living in the most deprived areas are 10 times less likely to live close to natural spaces. Just 35% of households with their annual incomes below £10,000 are within a 10-minute walk of a publicly accessible natural green space. So uh, points very well made. So we can now welcome, delighted to say, the uh, still relatively new Shadow Secretary of State for uh, Environment and Rural Affairs, uh, Steve Reid. Steve, welcome. Thank you very much for joining us tonight. Uh, uh, very good that you could be here. Um, I'd like to start, if I can, please, with the, the question, the title of this evening, uh, uh, which is, of course, what is Labour's plan to tackle the nature crisis? We know you've only been in a few weeks, uh, but we'll, we'll ask you this question. And um, what is Labour's plan to tackle the nature crisis? And can it help in any way help solve the crisis in our healthcare too? Uh, first of all, thank you for the uh, welcome. I'm sorry I'm late. Uh, what's happened is Shadow Cabinet all got called back into the main hall to uh, observe a minute's silence for the horrific deaths in Israel. And as a result of that, there's been a sort of a bit of a knock-on consequence of uh, us all turning up late to everything. So I do apologise for miss it, missing some people's um, contributions. And yeah, I've, I've been in this job three and a bit weeks, I think. So um, I can't sit here and claim to have all the answers yet. Um, but hopefully we've started to make a start and people may have noticed the decision we took on nutrient neutrality uh, where we wanted to demonstrate that for Labour there are red lines uh, when it comes to nature and we can meet that 
the house building needs of this country uh, by looking again at schemes the Conservatives have abandoned for house building targets in areas where they are needed and where they can be built much more sustainably. But what we won't let happen uh, is building in areas that are already um, heavily polluted, overloaded with toxins, and where additional homes will tip them perhaps into irreparable damage. So there are red lines, and we, I thought it was very important, so did Angela, that we established that, um, despite a lot of voices telling us it's a trap set by the Tories. No, it's a trap that the Tories have fallen into, because actually nature is our shared heritage, and we need to look after it, because without nature, there is no society, there is no economy, there is no food, there is no health, there is, there is no human society. Um, in Indeed. So that, that's my starting point. Uh, and even though I don't yet know all the detail of the issue, that is the approach that I'm going to take uh, as we're moving forwards. Now, you're, you're talking, your question was about um, our plan for the restoration of nature and the benefits of nature for health and well-being. Uh, yeah, so I'm just, I've had so many meetings one after the <laughs> other, I have to just check that I'm answering the right question that's the one. Uh, before, uh, before, I, before I move on. Thank you. Well, I mean... First of all, we, I do want to develop a full plan for nature, uh, perhaps a manifesto for nature, uh, before we get to the next manifesto. The Conservative government has just, first of all, despoiled nature uh, as if it's a, a resource that, um, that, is, that is going to last forever, and it isn't if we treat it the way that it is. And then more recently, they've just turned it into one of their divisive culture war battlefronts. Uh, again, as if it doesn't doesn't really matter. That latter, I think, won't work for them. I think people are much smarter than the Conservatives give them credit for. And I think people instinctively understand that our nature, our countryside, is part of our shared heritage in this country. The Labour Party and the Labour movement, for as long as we, as we have existed since the Industrial Revolution, has campaigned for people who are living in industrial an urban environments to also have access to the country and people who are living in rural environments also to have access to the natural beauty around them much of which is closed off to them so i fully understand the depth of the tradition for this inside the labor party and we do want to look at increasing access responsibly without damaging the livelihoods um, of people who are growing, producing and farming, without risking the safety of members of the public who perhaps don't understand the risks that there might be on working uh, farmland or, or with some forms of livestock. But we do want responsible access for more people. Um, and when you speak to farmers and producers and growers, they completely understand that, they're, that those two, the, the, the two interests are not in conflict, that there is, there is a negotiation to be had and an outcome to be got to. And before we get to the next election, I hope we'll be we can be clearer about exactly what that will look like. Um, in terms of nature itself, uh, we're already committed to preserving and extending those rich natural habitats uh, that, that, that wildlife are dependent on. Now, a third of our bird species are at risk of extinction in this country. A quarter of our mammal species are at risk um, of extinction. We know we need to be extending forests, wetlands, coastal environments, not just as habitats, but because they're so important for carbon storage and capture as well. The, the restoration of nature is actually part of a much wider agenda in tackling not just the nature crisis, but also the, the, the climate crisis. The two things for me are part of the one crisis. Uh, and, and I don't think we've yet developed an agenda in nature that is as big as the agenda Ed Miliband has been leading on um, on the climate. So I, I really want to build nature into that and look at how we can make an offer that makes sense to the public that connects both parts of this. For, from my experience as a council leader, um, the things that really made the difference in teaching people about the nature and climate crises and enabling them to take action and understand bigger action was by supporting communities to take action for themselves very, very locally. Um, and we, we had schemes where... Um, where there were bits of public land that were derelict, they would be handed to the community with support and some funding to turn them into an asset that the community could use, whether for communal growing or as a, a play space or a green space, whatever it might be. The community would decide for themselves. Another scheme that we had was a kind of a garden swap scheme where you had quite often a younger 
uh, younger people or a younger family living in a housing block where they had no access to outside space um, who wanted to do gardening or growing and you had elsewhere, perhaps in the same neighbourhood, older or vulnerable or disabled people who had outside space but were not able to tend it and look after it, then we would give access, with their permission of course, uh, to, that, to, to, to their garden, to, to the people that wanted to grow something there. And that not only gave people who wouldn't have had access to, 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 to outside space access to it, particularly important for young kids um, if they had them, but it also created intergenerational relationships and networks across society that made that whole of that community feel stronger and happier, and that creates greater resilience in communities as well. So I love projects like that. And uh, as we develop a more holistic plan for nature, I want that not to just be a top-down strategy directed from DEFRA, although I understand that an element of it will need to be that. I also want it to be bottom-up, where we support and empower communities to take action for themselves, because if people feel part of it, it's much harder for a Tory government to start talking about net zero, as it's just about um, blocking things you want to do and charging you more for it. But it's very important that people feel this is something that they can affect and something that they can connect with and something that is on um, their doorstep. Perhaps the last point I'll make before I shut up um, is um, about our waterways and, and sewage because of all the desecration committed by this government towards uh, nature, perhaps what they've done to the waterways is amongst the worst. Last year we had the highest level of illegal discharges of sewage uh, into our rivers, lakes and seas in our country's history. And yet at the same time, the government allowed the senior water executives of the companies responsible for doing that to pay themselves nearly £10 million in bonuses. Now, that is just absolutely intolerable that that was allowed to go ahead. So Labour um, will make the polluter pay, not the consumer, uh, and we'll put the water companies on special measures. That means compulsory monitoring of every uh, water outlet, severe and automatic fines for every um, illegal discharge so that they can no longer consider the relatively small fines as a cost of doing business. Uh, they need to be severe enough to deter them from doing that. Personal criminal liability for the senior executives who allow this to go on uh, without taking action to stop it. And the additional part of that plan that we announced um, earlier today was giving off what the power they need to block bonuses being paid by those senior executives to themselves when they're overseeing criminality, not just failure, but criminality that is destroying our nature. So there is a big plan to be put together around this. I don't have all the answers, but there's a few um, starting points as we work towards a real manifesto for nature, which is up to the challenge that nature faces. Shadow Secretary of State, thank you very much. I'm going to come to the audience here for questions in just a moment. Before I do so, just a couple of questions that we came in from the, the hundreds that we received from our online audience in advance. Um, we had a comment from uh, Paul Olive said, I am convinced Labour understands the climate crisis, but not sure they understand the nature crisis. Uh, does the panel have clarity on their plans to, to get us to 30 by 30, getting 30% of our land and sea in recovery for nature by 2030? So I think Paul will be pleased to hear you saying that you plan to get a, uh, a plan on nature up there uh, with the Labour's plan on climate. Stephen Ball uh, asked, the climate and nature crisis are already affecting people locally and globally, with the poorer worst affected. Among so many priorities, where do you think action and policy in these areas will sit in the Labour Party agenda? Do you just want to give me one sentence on that? Where does it sit in the, in the overall agenda, both climate and nature? Well, Keir appointed me to do this job, it was about three and a half weeks ago, wasn't it? He, 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 he phoned me up and he, he asked me to do this job because he says we haven't done enough in developing an agenda for nature. And I really want that to be a part of our manifesto moving forwards. That's from the, the mouth of the leader of the Labour Party. So he sees it as a priority. Um, I'm delighted to be given this job. I think it's so critical um, for, for, for our future that we get this right. And I'm determined to work with them. There's so many organisations uh, and people in and around the Labour Party 
Party and the Labour movement that have an interest that we can, I think we could pull something together very, very uh, radical and start to at least uh, address it. The, the decision we took on nutrient neutrality was meant to, and I think did, signal um, a change of direction and a new seriousness from us about this agenda. We're not just going to treat it as what's the political trap the Tories are trying to set for us and how do we avoid it. There's actually a real issue here uh, about the sustainability of our planet and our society and we're not going to dodge it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the stance you took on nutrient neutrality, by the way. I should say on behalf of the Wildlife Trust, and uh, we also very much hope you will take that stance if, if the government tries to bring something back in the King's speech on nutrient neutrality. But thank you very much. Let's go to questions from the audience. Um, I'll go straight to Martin, because he's, I know what he's going to be asking, roughly on a theme, and it's a, a very uh, important theme we need to pick up tonight. That's OK. Martin, uh, maybe just explain who you are as well, please. So, good evening. My name's Martin Lyons. I'm an arable farmer in Cambridgeshire, but I'm also the chief exec of the Nature Friendly Farming Network, which is a UK network of farmers. Many farmers, like my see, myself, see nature as an asset to their business, to their own mental health and to public goods. Many farmers recognise that they produce a lot more than just food. We often hear lots about food production, food security, but we actually produce a range of goods that society needs and nature needs and climate uh, benefits. Currently, the new government way of supporting farmers for public money for public goods is actually going to be rewarding me as an arable farmer to meet legal requirements in some of the aspects where we have other farmers are not getting rewarded for that landscape and heritage and particularly the less productive and upland farmers and where that's where people in public really want to enjoy their, their weekends and their, their landscape. How, I'll ask the whole panel, how can the future, the next government, support farmers in a way that gives access to the land, landscape for nature, for public health, and, and our own mental well-being better? So, Shadow Secretary of State, this morning um, on BBC Farming Today, you made some comments about what you think you'll do with the environmental land management schemes. You might want to just repeat those and then, uh, and obviously then play into Martin's wider question. Yeah, I, th I think ELMS is a, is, a, is a key part of the answer to that. So, ELMS is the environmental land management system that replaced the CAP, Common Agricultural Policy, subsidies after we left the European Union. Um, but it hasn't met the promises that were made for it. So many, many producers and growers, the smaller ones in particular, tenant farmers, are not getting the level of funding that they need in order to keep their, um, their land viable. Um, they're, they're facing bankruptcy. We've already lost 7,000 farmers and producers since 2019. Um, there are a range of factors, but this is one of them that, that, that is affecting them. They really, really want to steward the land responsibly. They work the land because they love the land. Uh, the, the interests they have are not in conflict with the protection of nature, but they're not being supported properly to, to do it. So I want to look again at the financial viability of the ELM scheme, make sure that all producers and growers and landowners who, who require and uh, should be entitled to support can access it, and that it works properly to support uh, and restore nature where where that 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 needs to happen. I'm off to visit. I don't know if you know Nep down in um, Sussex. I'm off to visit that in a couple of weeks, and I'm very interested in their uh, approach to uh, regenerative farming as well. You know, in in relatively difficult conditions down there as well, because the soil the soil is poor and it's on a chalk substrate, which means it's very difficult to 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 plough. But I, th I think it's really interesting what they've done there, farming, um, being able to make it financially viable, while also really doing some fantastic cutting-edge work on restoring uh, and, and, and keeping nature sustainable. So I think there are lessons for me to learn, and I'm going to get out there and learn them before um, I start pronouncing about what we're going to do in its entirety across this brief. And I'm sure we'd welcome you up to Cambridge here to visit your farm and, and wildlife trust farms as well, Steve. But uh, yeah, very good. OK, Fiona Harvey... Um, the, uh, it wasn't so long ago, Michael Gove was Secretary of State uh, for the Environment and big promises around uh, a new agricultural transition to much more environmentally friendly farming and so on. How's it gone from your perspective and what opportunities are there for uh, perhaps an incoming Labour government? Well, I think one of the issues is that, yes, farmers, a lot of farmers do want to uh, to farm in an environmentally friendly manner um, but there's also an element that well farmers have some 
quite strange ideas sometimes um, about uh, you know how everything should be very tidy, about uh, you know how things should should look, how things should be done, um, and I think there's an element of sort of re-education that needs to be done there uh, with farmers to show you know how much better they can farm in a nature-friendly way, but also there does need to be a stick that you do need to actually regulate farmers, and so you know one of the the things that we were promised, and I remember you know. Caroline Spellman, when she came in as a Conservative Environment Secretary in 2010, um, promising that even though there were these massive budget cuts for DEFRA, promising that everything that DEFRA did would still be kept up. And that was just not true. And of course, what we saw in the subsequent decade was that DEFRA was starved of cash uh, and the Environment Agency was starved of cash and they didn't go out and they didn't inspect farms um, and they, 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 the results of that are clear in our, uh, the sewage pollution that we see in the number of breaches of environmental regulations that we know are going on um, so I think there does need to be more actual regulation from more enforcement uh, from DEFRA as well as the encouragement and the helping. I think there's very few people in here that will defend the common agricultural policy but it's worth saying how one of the ways in which it worked is that the as farmers got payments for production, that was linked to something called cross-compliance, which, which was the stick that went with it. So it says you have to do these things, you have to stop pollution going in the watercourses to get your public subsidy. And that cross-compliance comes to an end next year. So um, I don't know, Steve, if you can say anything now about you know, intentions that a Labour government might have around maintaining the, the existing regulations on... Uh, you need to give me time to get into that one before right. I can answer the more that. detailed stuff. But I'm, I hope you've got the gist of my approach yeah. uh, from what I've said already. Okay, thank you very much. Joe, let me just come to you. I mean, clearly food, the wider food system and how food works and doesn't work has huge implications for the nation's health as well. Yeah, yeah I mean, I think um, two things really that come to mind around farming. I mean, one is obviously the sort of production of food and people's ability to be able to access um, fresh food and you know there are innovative models that have been sort of adopted around the country I live near, near Todmorden where they have their incredible edible um, program and you know there are all sorts of initiatives like that which are trying to get people closer to food um, because we you know we know that diet fundamental to um, sort of onset of all sorts of uh, conditions in later life um, so I think um, clearly that um, we really do need to understand the role that farmers play in the food production. The other thing I was going to touch on was um, there's some interesting work being done in Public Health Wales on farmers' mental health, because I think it's kind of quite interesting, you know, as somebody who works in the health field, we often don't talk about farmers as a sort of particular sort of segment of um, the workforce or the population where we should sort of particularly have concerns around their health and well-being. But there is a lot of evidence that it's an occupation that brings with it quite, a, you know, a lot of stress, a lot of uncertainty, not least because of a lot of the sort of legal structures that they're working within and so on. And, uh, you know, I think it's really excellent. Public Health Wales have sort of highlighted that as an issue that they're working on. Thank you, Joe. Elliot, let me come to you briefly before I go out to the audience for another question. What do you think are the opportunities there for an incoming Labour government about rebooting, refreshing environmental land management schemes, the agricultural transition to deliver better? Yeah, well, as you said, it was really welcome to, to see Steve this morning set out that, that, that they were going to review how ELMS works and how best it works. I really hope that review is an, is an excuse to delay because more than ever, if we're going to meet our environmental targets, we need to make sure we kind of progress with environmental and management schemes as well as climate targets, of course. But I would say that there are four big areas, if you are going to review, that I'd really, really focus on. Uh, the first of those, and I mentioned those earlier, is the size of the budget. At the moment, the budget settlement, as I said, is just based on how much money we had from the common agricultural policy. It doesn't look at environmental need. It doesn't look at how we're going to meet our environmental targets. So we need to look at, do we give enough budget to ELMS to meet our environmental targets? But there's also how you spend that budget. Unfortunately, we're in a situation at the moment where the most ambitious schemes in ELMS are oversubscribed. Landscape recovery, is an o o which will deliver big landscape restoration is oversubscribed from farmers. And likewise, higher tier, you're actually getting farmers who want to do the most for nature being turned away. I mean, it's a bonkers situation. The natural England are currently um, 
processing 80% less applications than they were 10 years ago due to funding and capacity issues. So you're having farmers go to Natural England and say, I want to do loads for nature, and they're saying, sorry, we don't have enough capacity to be able to put you through the system. The second area, and it was mentioned by Fiona, is regulation. We're losing cross-compliance, and these are the rules that protect our water buffers, protect our hedgerows, protect our soil. We're losing those regulations in January. The government don't have a plan on what to replace them with. But in certain areas, we need to go further. The National Action Plan for the Sustainable Use of Pesticides. The government consulted on it, what, four years ago now, and we don't have a plan yet. It's something that they really need to look at, as well as slurry management. Uh, ammonia pollution is one of the leading causes of air pollution. I think it makes up a quarter of all air pollution in London. So regulation needs to start dealing with issues like that. The third is that the government has no wider vision for food policy. Uh, and you mentioned this this morning as well, which is we need minimum trade standards. We need a kind of wider food policy on how this all fits together, as well as ensuring a uh, fair supply chain. And the third one, and, and again, it was really welcome to see you, hear, you, hear you talk about this, was a land use strategy is our land is facing so many competing demands. Farming, of course, is the big one, but you've also got housing, where nature goes. We've heard the shadow, shadow uh, chancellor talk about energy infrastructure, where that goes. That needs to be properly planned. At the moment, you've got this kind of chaotic system of things going everywhere. So a proper land use strategy, understanding where this money is best spent, where you get your best bang for your buck and taxpayers' money is best delivered through a proper land use strategy is the fourth area. You start looking at those four areas and you can start getting environmental land management schemes working properly great thank you very much let's go back out to the audience for another question uh we haven't got an awful lot of time so i'm going to say if please uh, don't ask another question on farming huge important as it is but we want to cover as many issues as we can um yeah lady at the front here please maybe you can just introduce yourself as well thanks yeah i'm alison mcginnis i'm the esg manager at liverpool one um I've got a question regarding... The ESG manager at Liverpool One. So just for the online audience, ESG is... Uh, Environmental, social and governance manager. Right, Liverpool. and Liverpool, I mean, it, impossible to believe. Not everyone would know what Liverpool One is, but maybe just give us a sentence. Or uh, how do you describe Liverpool One in one <laughs> sentence? Liverpool One was 15 years old this year. Really? Um, wow. Yes, yeah, celebrated our 15-year birthday this year. Um, it's a regeneration project, really. Um, it's not your average shopping destination. We have a five and a half acre park. We now have a 27 metre living wall. Um, we're looking at nature connection sessions on our site. Um, yes, there's a lot of retail there. We've got 170 occupiers, um, increasingly non-retail. We've got about 30% of those occupiers are not retail. The future in terms of how we consume our goods is changing. We're hoping to reflect that. We're hoping to distribute yet more green infrastructure. We've got really ambitious plans and have it distributed across the site and right in the center of liverpool right website. in the yeah, center of liverpool um, yeah. yeah and right next to the waterfront as well great thank you uh, please go to the question but i need to pull that out okay if england had had a commission for future generations would hs2 have gone ahead oh oh, oh. there's a fun one um fiona <laughs> drop <laughs> fiona well um I think it's extraordinary what the government has done with HS2 in cancelling the Northern Leg and making it impossible for the next government to revive it, uh, which is something which is extraordinary, unprecedented and anti-democratic, really. Um, a lot of people uh, in the environment side uh, are, were against uh, HS2. Um, I was never one of them. Um, one of the reasons for that is that it is what you can see coming to pass now, which is that uh, it was never a question of, you know, HS2 or nothing. What we're seeing now is uh, instead of HS2, we'll have a massive road building scheme. Um, and that will do untold damage to um, all kinds of, of uh, uh, you know, in, in environmental problems and, and, you know, all kinds of damage to nature will arise from that. Um, so... The, the issues around HS2, I think, were never really very clearly explained to people. Um, and we, yeah, there was a kind of a, a sort of a false, false impression given of HS2 that it was just in order to get people a little bit faster um, from London to, to Manchester. That was never really the point. It was also about taking capacity 
uh, or increasing capacity to take some of the congestion off existing railways um, and to improve, therefore, uh, the railway network in the north. Um, it would have been a fantastic project. I think it's an absolute tragedy uh, for the UK's environment that we are not going ahead with HS2 because instead what we're going to get is loads more roads uh, and loads more flying uh, and that doesn't benefit uh, anyone. So in answer to your question, if we'd had some kind of, uh, some, some better argument, some better insight into HS2, then I think we would be going ahead and it's dreadful that we're not. Um, Steve, do you want to... Uh, uh, add to this, I, I, I largely agree. Uh, largely agree with that. The, I mean, the the, the point of HS2 was it's a, a regeneration scheme to help tackle regional inequalities, which are immense in this country. We've gone from being in the 1970s the most equal country in Europe to today the most unequal country in Europe. And while we were in the EU, many of England's regions were amongst the very poorest regions anywhere in Europe, and yet we're the fifth biggest economy on the planet. Now, that, it's, it's extraordinary that we could have had such a, uh, a situation develop where that level of inequality is basically tearing our country apart. And we do need to in, in invests in the connectivity that allows um, investment to flow into regions that have been starved of it um, for decades. But secondly, I mean, all of us use public transport. It's broken in this country. It's broken. People are forced onto the roads because public transport is so slow, so expensive, so unreliable. And we have to invest in better public transport if we want to open up um, the ability to get around the country to many more people than, than currently use it and stop forcing people to use far less sustainable modes of transport. So I, th I think this government is culpable for la letting HS2, the costs to overrun to the extent that they did. As Rachel says in her speech today, HS2 ended up costing 10 times more than the equivalent scheme in France. 10 times more. How on earth did this incompetent government let this scheme run out of, uh, out of control to the extent that it then had to be cancelled, making our country tragically the laughing stock, uh, I think, of Europe, because we cannot invest in schemes for the long-term uh, benefit of all of the regions of our country. And we cannot invest in public transport that helps our country to become more sustainable. What a legacy the Conservatives have created for themselves. Thank you, Steve. Uh, Joe Elliott, if it's all right, I'm going to go back out for another question because we've got so many issues to get to. It's worth saying, as Wildlife Trust, we've got a lot of information about HS2 on our website. In fact, we had a Wild Live specifically on it last year. And very broadly, we, of course, Wildlife Trust, really strongly support investment in public transport and would like to see investment in new railways. But we did have some problems with how HS2 was being done in practice uh, and causing real impacts for nature. And I, I wonder if actually we can have a move a debate from whether it's just for or against HS2 to how it could be done something like that could be done a lot better because I, I personally I think the debate's got a bit stuck in that in that binary uh, uh, area um, okay let's go back out uh, gentleman at the back there hi um, I'm James Banning from Cheshire Wildlife Trust so um, I run our campaigns locally and what we're finding is we've got a lot of new developments happening in our region um, obviously we've got a need to get to net zero through our green jobs and green investment but I'm finding a lot of these sites are being placed on peatlands and they're obviously so important for protecting our climate and they're a natural resource, they're so important for wildlife. What can we do to make sure that these sites are taken out of local planning strategies? Elliot, can I come to you first on that, just yeah. to sort of set, help set it up a little bit? Absolutely. Uh, I think the problem, particularly when the debate comes to planning, we've had a lot about planning at the Labour conference over the last couple of days, is that over the last decade or so, there's been a real kind of shift to nature versus housing. You can have one or the other, and as Steve alluded to it earlier, first you have George Osborne taking aim at the habitats directives, that's why we're not meeting our housing targets. Then you had uh, Boris Johnson said there are too many newts everywhere, that's why we weren't meeting our housing targets. Uh, and of course, most recently, Rishi Sunak uh, trying to dismantle uh, the neut neutrality rules to allow house builders to put more pollution into our rivers, because of course they're clean enough. Um, and so it's always been this false dichotomy that you can either have housing or nature, when as you, you rightly say, we need to have a planning system which could do both. Because if you don't ultimately, firstly, it's the ultimate short-termism in, in building houses that destroy nature against that kind of long-term need. It's probably what Keir Starmer would call kind of sticking plaster politics when it comes to planning. 
The second big issue, and it's been touched on, is health inequalities. If we destroy nature near people's homes, that will exacerbate existing health inequalities. And I think the third big area where we need to deal with this issue is, is all about consent, really, is that people want houses in their local area if they improve the local environment and if they improve nature in that area. So we need to make sure that we're building um, the houses that people need, firstly. Um, often that is much more social housing and improving existing housing stock. Uh, Shelter estimate there's over a quarter of a million people in the country currently homeless. And Lord's Best Affordability uh, Review said that there are almost five million people who had a serious housing need. Often those are people who need social housing, not the big luxury housing that we see. Um, we also need to make sure they're built in the right place. And I think the planning system, if we're, if we're going to look at reform, it needs to be much clearer about those places that are off limits for nature, that those places that are too important for nature and climate to build upon. And making sure that they're in the right place to start off with will stop this long protracted um, uh, costly process for developers about arguing where they should best be. And peatlands are a perfect example of places that, that probably shouldn't be built on. And of course, thirdly, we need to be building houses in the right way, making sure that access to nature in those places is standard, that you can have access on your doorstep, which will help address health inequalities. And finally, when you, start, when you get that bit right, you can start having a planning system for housing in particular, which can actually contribute to nature's recovery. It shouldn't be enough that, that the planning system should make sure it doesn't make things proper, any worse, but actually starts improving on nature and, and putting it into recovery. And one perfect way you can do that is uh, by increasing the contribution that planning makes to biodiversity net gain. At the moment, it's at 10%. If you opt it to 20%, they could actually start making a contribution to nature's recovery. Okay, thank you, Elliot. Um, Joe, at the Health Foundation, I mean, we, we, we know that uh, Labour is talking about one of its five missions being in a NHS Fit for the Future, talks about a neighbourhood health service. I mean, there's a big role for planning, isn't there, to, to make sure that those neighbourhoods are healthy? Yeah, I mean, I think certainly. And I think this is where um, councils have a role to play. So... Um, you know, the, the NHS is kind of run through its own structures, but increasingly what we're seeing is more joining up between NHS or planning and commissioning and delivery of services and councils, whether it's through health and wellbeing boards or the new integrated care boards. And I think that joining up between the responsibilities that councils have around planning and shaping the environment, whether it's about the sort of food environment that people live in and sort of fast food whether it's about making um, the best of the sort of opportunities of bits of land and parks and so on um, the more I think that we can bring that decision making that councils are responsible for with the decision making that the NHS has in terms of sort of meeting health need the more we'll be able to start seeing some of this longer term thinking I think the problem is at the moment is that you know, the benefit often falls several years out of the decisions being made. And we've got to sort of start thinking about how at that local level, there's more incentives for people to sort of think about how they use budgets in a way that works for that community, both kind of today and in the longer term. Joe, thank you very much. Fiona, um, the planning has been a bit of a political football, hasn't it? Uh, I just wanted to yeah, say something about that because uh, we've just at The Guardian, we've just done a big investigation into uh, the relationship between Tories and house builders um, and the results were quite shocking mm. um, because the, the, the Tory party, house builders are, are one of the biggest uh, sources of their donations. Uh, about one pound in every ten of donations to the Tory party since 2010 have come from house builders. Um, and this has been really bad for the country because uh, house builders have benefited to the tune of, we reckon, at least £15 billion uh, at a very conservative estimate uh, since 2015 from the fact that the, the Conservatives allowed them to get away with building uh, houses that are high carbon. They aren't built to low carbon standards. Uh, they don't have uh, heat pumps or solar panels. We're still building houses without solar panels. Um, and they don't have uh, uh, high-grade insulation. As a result, so house builders have saved £15 billion. All those costs, the retrofitting that is going to cost us as a country somewhere between 33 and 45 billion to rectify that. And that's, well, you know, that's what you get when you have the Tories having that relationship with house builders. 
Steve Reid, um, how would a Labour government use the planning system to, to, yes, enable new houses to be built, which everyone knows needs to happen, but also to be done in a way that improves our health, improves our environment? Yeah, I, I, I think part of it is tackling what Fiona just described there, which is it's corruption is what's actually been going on here. You know, when um, Robert Jenrick, certainly when I was shadowing him, uh, when I was community secretary, was overriding decisions by local planning committees to benefit extremely wealthy Conservative Party donors. That's corruption. Uh, and it shouldn't be allowed to happen. And there was no investigation for that by the Cabinet Secretary because the Prime Minister at the time, Boris Johnson, wouldn't authorise the investigation to go ahead. You know, there's no other word for for, for the way that they were, were, were running that operation, I think, than that. Um, and that mitigates against what my view is about how a planning reform might work, which answers your goes away some way towards answering your question, Craig. I think local communities understand that we need more housing. Um, Labour wants to get back to having housing targets in different areas so that we can start to meet the need that those areas have. And they have to do that if they're going to be able to grow um, economically and sustainably. Too, too many areas, people can't afford to live there anymore. We need to get the kind of homes that people can afford to live in. But I also think that local communities are sensible enough and understand their own um, communities well enough, including the needs for community infrastructure, including the needs to protect nature, to be able to be given a significant role in taking those decisions uh, and devising the strategies for how those houses should or should not be built. So we want to see local communities have a much bigger say uh, over how this happens. There would be parameters, of course. There's going to be a review of planning. It's too slow and come some at the moment and you get planning blight when, when there is a proposal over an area to develop something and no decision is taken for years and years and years it blights that area, nobody knows what can happen and what can't happen and therefore nothing happens and we don't want that to happen either so we need to make it faster but we also need to make it much more responsive to the to the interests and the needs of local people who are living there. And you know, as a Democrat uh, and a committed localizer, I genuinely believe that the wisdom of local people about their own communities is better than the um, the decisions about it that might be taken more remote, remotely, particularly in Whitehall. Thank you very much. Okay, back out for one final question, and I'm going to ask you. Let's make it about the connection between environment and health, if we can, please. So, oh. Go on then, Richard. Go on, Richard Benwell. Uh, uh, he's looking, he's smiling sweetly at me. So, uh, and maybe explain who you are, Richard, as well. Uh, and I, I'm giving it to you because you do, you can speak on behalf of many organisations. So. Thanks, Craig. I'm quickly retrofitting my question to put health in there. Uh, uh, so, Richard Benwell from Wildlife and Countryside Link, which is a coalition of nature organisations. Uh, Mr. Reid spoke earlier about the polluter pays principle, and that's really important when it comes to health for rivers because, of course, people are literally getting sick when they go swimming in polluted rivers. But it's worth remembering that this particular scandal isn't the only one that's ever happened. Think before of the Dieselgate scandal, where people people's air was being polluted by criminality in the car industry doing using those cheap devices to make cars pass the tests. Think before of the chemicals industry dumping things like forever chemicals across the environment. It's not the only time this has happened. So the start of my polluter pays question is, will you apply those principles that you talked about this morning for the water industry more broadly? So that when the next scandal emerges, we don't have to go through this again. And we know that corporates who engage in criminality to make a profit at the expense of people's health won't get away with it. Just a very quick second part, if I may. Um, uh, polluter pays must go beyond just offsetting. That's been the limit of the government's imagination. Can you envisage a situation where we're asking polluters not just to offset a little bit of their footprint, but to actually start investing in nature's recovery? That's good for health, too. <laughs> in about a minute, please. About a minute. I'm very sympathetic to what you outlined there, but I'll, I, you know, I'll need to have a look at the detail of how it might operate before I can give you a full um, answer on on that. I mean, the, the link between sewage and health is an obvious one. Who's going to send their kid to swim in a lake if they think they're going to get sick from raw human excrement that might be floating around? It is just such an obvious one. Why we need to clean up this mess, and I've already outlined what we might do about that. I just final comment. I just want to out myself as a camper here as well. I, every, every summer, I take my bell tent and I go camping. That, that's how I relax the fastest. And I do that because for me, and work can sometimes be stressful as it is for many of us, 
the, the way that I relax the fastest and de-stress is by getting out into nature. And I want other people who are denied that opportunity to have the same opportunities that I do to experience and enjoy and benefit from the well-being uh, benefits that you get from nature. And that, that will drive our agenda as well as we're starting to shape it. Thank you very much. Okay, I'm going to come to each panelist then for a, a, a 30 second summary around the conversations we've we've had tonight. I'll come back to you finally as well, uh, Shadow Secretary of State. Uh, Fiona, let me start with you. Just what is the, your burning final thoughts as we close here, uh, particularly about this thing, this link between environment and health? Yeah, I think um, the one that I started with actually is still the most important, that this is an issue of social equity, um, that everyone in our society has a right, it deserves uh, a good health and good environment. Thank you very much. Elliot Chapman-Jones of the Wildlife Trusts, uh, give us that sort of summary. And, you know, what do we particularly want to see from an incoming Labour government around this issue? Well, I think there's a massive political opportunity here. If you look at the polling, both parties are trusted least on who will protect the environment than any other issue. That Britain is a nation of nature lovers, and it is crying out for a political party to grab this issue. The Tory party, I think, unfortunately, have lost some of their lead on this with broken promises from beavers to nutrient neutrality. Pre previous Labour governments have understood this important part of our national story, whether it was the Attlee government after the Second World War giving us the national parks in 1949, which was then built upon by Tony Blair with the Countryside and Rights of Way Act in his first term in government. I think uh, there's a great political opportunity here uh, in the new Nature Manifesto that we might get from the Labour Party to really grab this issue and speak to those kind of people because it's based upon security, Food security, water security is based upon the economy and our future well-being. And, of course, it's based upon addressing deep-rooted inequalities. Thank you. And Joe from the Health Foundation, uh, you know, it, it feels there's a big health sector in this country. There's a fairly large environment sector. We haven't done enough together on these issues, have we? No. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, I was just thinking, just listening to this conversation that's been um, really um, great for me, um, just how many parallels that they are. So we've talked about the fact that we do know access to nature is really good for people's health, their mental health, their well-being, and so on. But I think the problems and the challenges we face are also quite similar. So just the whole concept of the polluter pays, you know, so we have polluters to our health as well in the sort of food industry and air pollution and so on. So we've really just got to start recognising that we have a kind of finite human capital and a finite environmental capital and we just can't afford to sort of fritter it away really and it needs protecting. So I think there's the mutual benefits but also some of the shared challenges and solutions that we need to protect both our assets. Steve Reid, Shadow Secretary of State. Uh, is a Labour government really going to grab, all, grab this agenda? It has to. You know, there, there are, I mean, politically, there are 20 million people who are member, members of nature um, organisations, a third of the population. People really care about this. It's not just a divisive um, battlefront in the culture wars that always want to run. People care about nature because we're not, we're not distant from nature. We are part of it. Uh, and we destroy it at our peril. Without nature, there is no economy and therefore no um, economic growth. There is no health. There is no food. There is no human society. So I think it is imperative that given the twin uh, crises of nature and climate, the next Labour government develops an agenda equal to the challenge. We won't do it on our own. We'll do it with the goodwill of all the people in organisations that can help us shape that up. But I'm determined that by the time we get to the, uh, the next general election, we have a manifest festo that can not just protect but can restore our nature and then we have to leave it so please say a big thank you to our panel fiona harvey elliot chapman jones joe bibby and steve reed um, if you want to know more there's more in uh, the wildlife trust port report and natural health service you can get that online and of course don't forget that you can look on the uh, wildlife trust youtube channel to watch the equivalent event that we had at conservative party conference last week with rebecca powell uh, the junior minister in defra ben goldsmith James Murray from Business Green and Vicky Hurd from the Wildlife Trust. And actually, if you want to catch up on any of our previous episodes of Wildlife, there's ones there devoted to discussion on HS2. Uh, there's ones there about water pollution with Fergal Sharkey. There's ones about agriculture with Minette Batters from the NFU. And of course, we've got an episode of Wildlife all about health and nature as well. Many of them have now had tens of thousands of views online. So do look at those and, and catch up on them. But 
to finish off now, thank you very much to our live audience here in Liverpool. Thank you for joining us. See you at the next Wild Live. Good night.